Hey guys, this is Dr. Berg. I have a really interesting uh, interview today with Tiffany Roth. And uh, I heard about her from several of my clients and I just wanted to interview uh, you. You're from California, right? Yes. Yeah. So it's interesting. She's an attorney, but then she also, she taught classes in Mexico on, on fitness and now she does a lot of things online. And I just wanted to kind of pick your brain because one thing I don't focus as much on is exercise. So I really wanted to kind of find out from you, especially with females, like what to do to improve the workouts. So would you mind asking you some questions about that? Oh, absolutely. I okay, love it. I cool. love talking about working out. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so I guess you were, when you were a kid, you were kind of chubby, right? I heard, I heard from the grapevine, you weren't in really good shape. <laughs> okay. You want to bring that up? Now. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> So, yeah, when I was little, you know, I think that one of the things is that, you know, my family really didn't know to, how to focus on healthy eating and exercise. So, you know, I was kind of eating the foods that my mom was eating and I wasn't getting the proper exercise and my body had that result. Where, where, um, where, were, you, I, I where, think, where were you raised as a child? Where was I raised? Yeah. In California. Okay. I got it. Yeah. So I, was I'm, it... I'm, I'm, LA native. I think people assume uh -huh. that when you're in California that it's all health foods, but it's probably similar to the Midwest where I was raised. You know, it's just probably the same meat and potatoes, but I don't know. Well, I think right now over the last 20 years as, as a community in general, we've gotten a lot more access to information about how to eat healthy and how to exercise than existed in the past. I mean, it's sort of something that's been developing over time, especially with, you know, the internet. We can get the message out there a lot quicker about how to be healthy or how to do great workouts. Back then, you know, it was sort of like you just go on a diet and you eat grapefruit. I remember my mom was doing the pineapple diet where she ate pineapple for three days. So I ate pineapple for three days, you know, and you lose weight, but it's not sustainable. So, I know. Um, I know. I think it's just the, really the knowledge that we have um, in this day and age allows us to make better choices when it comes to food and exercises that really wasn't available back then, at least to, to my mom. No, I think I actually, I actually practiced in San Diego for a while um, next to the Charger Stadium. I was in, when I graduated, I wanted to um, move where I wanted to live. So I moved to Washington State because mm -hmm. it's so beautiful, but it rained every day. So I just couldn't, <laughs> couldn't take it. It was beautiful, but it just too much rain. So then I decided let's let's move to San Diego. Uh -huh. So I went there, um, and I'm like, wow, this is so beautiful. This is great. But all my family, because I met my wife there, and then all my family lived on the East Coast. So we and her family. So we moved to Virginia. But it's a. Um, I mean, I think it's a it's a great place to live um, on the West Coast. But so here's, here's some questions I want to get into. Um, now, with your clients um, that you work with, what's kind of like um, the top mistakes that people are making when they're working out? Like, what are they always doing wrong when they're doing it by themselves? Okay. Well, first I'm going to start, I'm going to start with one of the three things that I say, not one of the three things, three of the most important things that what I call the three prongs of fitness, and that's constant and consistent commitment. So the first thing I want to tell anybody who wants to get in shape is that you have to be committed and you can't give up. And the reason why a lot of people give up is because either it comes too hard or maybe they get injured or when they're doing the workouts, they're not feeling the way they want to feel. So some of the tips that I would like to provide will be on how to breathe correctly, how to work out so that you're not getting injured and how to check your body alignment in the mirror to make sure that you're getting the results that you set out to achieve. Okay, so let's talk right. about breathing first. Okay, okay breathing. So typical mistake. Isn't it, isn't it okay to just can't we just hold our breath? No. <laughs> the typical mistake is this: people are working out, right? They're doing it, and the harder it gets, <laughs> the less they start to breathe. Okay, so I do, and like when I'm teaching class, if it's a uh, a cardio class, I do an eight count. And I do the eight count, it's really like sort of check, it's almost like a call and response. I'll say eight, and then let's count down with me. Eight, seven, six, 
spot. That way I know that they are breathing because one of the most important things that our body needs for movement is breath. We have to connect the breath with the movement to get actually the power that you need to continue. So I do, a, when you're doing your um, cardiovascular, make sure that you do what's called a talk test. You should be able to say one or two or three words while you're doing your cardio. If you're not, then your breathing is off. You need to take it down a little bit so you can say, yeah, I'm okay. okay. I got this or something Good. like that. Or so let me uh, interject right there. So let's say for example, and I just want to know your philosophy on this. Um, you put someone through a workout, and they do a certain set, right? They're doing a certain set. I mean, we're not talking about like aerobics. We're talking about like a, a set of maybe some plyometrics or push-ups or whatever, right? And then they're going to rest for a period of time. Do you have any rule of thumb of how long a person rests versus the time they're exercising? Um, because I know there's a lot of um, variation there. Okay. Well, it's, it's, it depends on how you're training and what you're training for, Okay. If you are training to build muscle, then you need more rest in between your sets because you want to actually maximize your output per exercise. So um, I would tell like, you know, some of my girls that really want to build their leg muscles or what's really hot is like to build up your butt right now. If you're doing heavy squats, if you're working out with heavier weight, then you would need like at least 45 to one, 45 seconds to one minute rest in between sets to allow your muscles to recover and, you know, be able to go back and maximize the benefit out of the exercise. You don't want to exercise when you're tired. You know, you want to exercise when your body feels exhilarated and strong. Um, if you want to tone your body, then I shorten that rest. I shorten that rest because I like to focus on muscle confusion and I'll do back to back sets. For example, if you just want to tone your legs, then you might do lunges, then you do squats, and then you do what I call rocket squats, and I'll put them back to back, boom, 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 to build that muscle endurance. When you build your muscle endurance, you actually have more lean, long muscles, and they are able to go for a longer period of time, but they don't deliver the maximum amount of power as if you would trying to build like a stronger, hardier muscle shape. I, I think that brings up a really important point on, um, you have the person with the belly fat, right? Mm -hmm. Women don't like belly fat for some right. reason. They, they don't like it. And then you have the fat in the lower part of the legs. Right. So um, here's what I found. Um, you can actually flatten the stomach a lot faster mm -hmm. if you actually address the diet. Yes, in a unique absolutely. way. And I'm going to give you a couple tips on that for your, your viewers too, if you want to share this. But, um, but the lower extremity, the legs, you're, uh -huh. not, you're not going to get the fat off the legs unless you use exercise. Because um, a lot of these women, especially you probably work with menopausal women, they, mm -hmm. the, the ratio of fat to uh, muscle is like way off. Like they, they've okay. lost so much muscle tone and you haven't tried to do a squat and they just like, oh, they just can't do it. So right. you have to build up that muscle and that could take literally a few years of workouts. So as you lose the muscle, as, as you gain the muscle, you may not lose weight because it's heavier, of course, but also there's going to be probably weeks that you're going to plateau mm -hmm. and then you're going to have to um, just realize it's going to take some time because you're actually, you're healing the body. So, and I don't know if you saw this on my website, but um, my health philosophy is get healthy, then lose weight versus trying to lose weight to get healthy. It's, yeah. a, it's a simple thing, but it's like really powerful. Yeah, I really am intrigued by your whole philosophy. And I think that it's really vital for people to understand how your gut health and your um, nutritional intake is so important in getting the results that you want. And I love how you focus on the different body types. That to me is wonderful because if you have someone that really like has like skinny legs, they could care less about like doing the legs. They really just want to work the, on their bellies. It would take a very, very, very long time before they were able to work the, work out and get rid of all that by just doing exercise alone. You have to change your diet. And your philosophy on food is something that I really want to align with because I think that it's powerful and it creates awesome results. So like what are some of the tips that you give like even to some of my followers that could help them like get a healthy gut and see um, better and quicker results in the abdominal area. Well, there's one thing that's probably the most important. It's like the common thread um, with, with pretty much 80% of all the problems. I'm talking like body problems and weight problems. You, mm -hmm. you ready for this? Are you sitting down? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> good. 
Um, it really has to do with uh, high levels of insulin. Mm. But but here's the thing: insulin is um, has a lot of different functions. Um, but insulin has two really really important functions that people need to realize. Number one, it um, it's the hormone that converts everything to fat. It's a fat making hormone. Number one. Number two, it prevents the loss of fat. So you, if you're, let's say you're eating good and you're exercising six hours a day, whatever. Like I had one patient who was working out six hours a day, um, but they weren't losing anything, right? Or they have a stuck metabolism. It's like totally frozen. They can't get below that set point. It's, it's high levels of insulin. But when you go to the doctor, they check the glucose. They don't check the insulin. Whoops. If they did, they would find the insulin is going to be too high. And what people realize is like, what they don't realize is how to lower insulin. Right. You can actually, um, you can help someone like, like losing weight way more by addressing that than exercise. Exercise will like really, will it help? But if you actually address the insulin, you'll really, really drop down the weight a lot faster. You get leaner, you get stronger really, really fast. So that's like the most important thing you need to kind of focus on if you're trying to um, get lean body mass, if you're trying to fix your metabolism is lower insulin. So then I'll have, right. then I have a, how do you do that? How, how do you do, you do that? that? So do you have any idea right now, like what you would do to lower insulin? Do you have any ideas? I'm just asking before I tell you. Okay. Well, I would say number one is to reduce your, reduce your um, sugar in, intake and your simple carbohydrates. Good. Yes. That's number one. So you want to reduce your carbs, you know, the ones mm -hmm. that turn into sugar really fast. So that would be all the breads, pasta, cereal, crackers, biscuits, waffles, pancakes, muffins, sodas, juice, those. Right. And then you'd have alcohol. But then you also have a lot of the hidden carbs as well, like fruit. Ah! I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, so because what happens, you fruit Don't is. Say fruit, not the fruit. I love fruit. <laughs> sorry, but fruit, fruit. What fruit will do is, uh, it doesn't actually address the blood sugars directly because it's fructose. It actually has a different pathway, and it could, it throws you off through the liver. So it will eventually affect the uh, insulin, but not directly. So it, people say, oh yeah, it doesn't affect the blood sugars. Yes, it does indirectly, but. So we have, we have that, right? Um, but that's like half of the answer. So people mm -hmm. on a low carb diet, they might be successful somewhat, but they're not a hundred percent successful because there's something else, um, that's equally as important. Do you want to know about this? Yes. I'm going okay. to my seat. Tell me. Okay. <laughs> it's has to do with every time you eat anything, you raise insulin. So it's the frequency of meals the frequency of meals. So I used to promote and push in my old book, oh yeah, you need to uh, consume six meals a day, three meals with snacks, right? Mm -hmm. Bad, bad advice. That was very bad because every time you eat, you spike insulin, yeah. even if it's healthy. So with myself, I was eating apples and peanut butter as the afternoon snack. And then at night I would have nuts, right? Uh -huh. And uh, I got up to like 211 pounds. So then I, I went back to Guyton's physiology. I'm studying this. I'm like, what the heck? I missed this one point about the food increases insulin. So then I started looking at, okay, let's do intermittent fasting, eating less frequent. So we went three meals, no snacks, and then two meals a day. And that's kind of where I'm staying right now. But you can drop insulin so nicely and fix so many problems by cutting out the snacks. It's, it's insane. So yeah. Yeah. That whole thing about snacks is really like based on the information that if, after you're going to spike your metabolism up, um, you can spike your metabolism up with protein, which will help your muscles sort of be more sustainable and you will keep your body from feeding on its own tissue. Okay. So um, let me, let me, so let me just bring up that one point because here's another piece of false data where, um, you're eating protein to spike your metabolism. Mm -hmm. Okay. So really let's, uh, let's define what that, that thought would mean. It's basically you eating protein will stimulate a hormone that can trigger your metabolism. Mm -hmm. But if your metabolism is slow, you're just going to spike insulin. Mm -hmm. so, so 
So this idea that eating stimulates metabolism is false data. It actually slows the metabolism because it increases insulin. Mm. So tell me, so for example, how would eating a piece of chicken um, increase your insulin? Just like because, someone who's because, out there like, I want to have my chicken. Because protein, <laughs> protein, there's two types of uh, macro foods that stimulate insulin. One is carbs and the other one is protein. Mm -hmm. Especially if it's lean protein. Mm. So the bre the chicken breast, everyone's like every low fat protein, low fat protein. No, yeah. no, 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 no. Because because really, if you want to keep insulin low, you want to go more fat. Fat is the food that will be neutral with insulin. Uh -huh. Can this you explain is, why? Yeah, because um, our bodies. Um, one of the function is insulin actually helps you uh, build muscle. Uh -huh. So when you stimulate, when you eat an amino acid from protein, uh, your body will increase insulin to try to put that to muscle. So, you know, we need protein for sure. And you want to keep eating protein, but you don't want to do excessive amounts of protein. Like a lot of bodybuilders and stuff, they have tons of protein because that's going to make you, eventually you're going to actually stimulate some insulin. You're going to get tired after you eat. You're going to want to take a nap. Yeah. That's high insulin. And then what happens when the insulin goes high, you develop insulin resistance. And then you have, you urinate in the middle of the night more than once or once or more. That's, you shouldn't do that. You get tired after yeah. you eat. You get That's it. really interesting. I, I'm going to have to interrupt you there. I know someone who has that problem with frequent urination. And this is a really, this is actually, this is something that's really going to help her and probably a lot of other women out there that, you know, it's the insulin. That's interesting. I've never heard of that before. It's fascinating. I mean, uh, insulin, you have uh, vision problems. Your vision starts going. Uh -huh. Brain fog. Uh -huh. Lack of focus. Yes. Um, irritability, low tolerance to stress. Mm -hmm. This is all a blood sugar problem. So, so what um, are you recommending though? You're saying two meals a day? Well, no, so you start, you st I have a little mini course that I put everyone through first. It's a free little course online at my website. You, you basically, there's like four videos, get the basics to learn how to do this, but you start with two, three meals, no snacks. Okay. And the problem is some people can't go from one meal to the next because they're so hungry. So you add more fat to the meal. Okay. And then what happens is that, uh, it's oh, slow burning. It's more slow burning, right? Well, it just buffers the insulin spike. Ah, okay. Uh -huh. So then it's more satisfying versus the low fat protein. So then what happens, you do that for a while until you start, your body starts adapting. Mm -hmm. and, and then it's starting adapting to running, burning on fat. So you're actually burning fat at this point. When you burn fat, it's a much cleaner fuel. You have more energy. You'll have less blood sugar issues. <clears throat> then in the morning when you wake up, you're not going to be hungry. So then you start pushing your breakfast further and further towards the lunch until eventually you don't have any more breakfast. Mm -hmm. That's how you do it. You do it gradually so it's comfortable. Mm -hmm. So you're recommending lunch and dinner then, no breakfast. You're going to go against all of what society has been saying about the breakfast is the most healthy and important meal of the day. And you're going to say no to that. <clears throat> hey, listen, I was the guy who wrote the book on eating breakfast. I have videos <laughs> on YouTube right now, that I probably should delete that <laughs> keep pushing. You guys need to have your breakfast. Do you know why I told people that? Why? Because I had such a blood sugar when I was a kid and also all through, uh, teenage years into early, uh, in, like when I was 20, that what twenties. And then all of a sudden I started going, wow, I started eating protein for breakfast and I felt so good that I said, this is it. This is what everyone needs to do. But the reason I felt good is because I spiked insulin because I had low blood sugar. So I raised the blood sugar. I felt better, but I didn't right. think what's really underneath it. I didn't, I was, I was just kind of like going off a of feeling. It's kind of like, Hey, I feel good when I drink alcohol. So alcohol is good for me. I'm like, uh -huh. So the point is that you just really understand what's happening. If you have a blood sugar, which most people have a blood sugar problem, um, you don't want to do the frequent meal thing. It's a real bad idea. So there's a way to adapt your body to running on fat fuel, which very few people know about, uh, and they don't know how to do it correctly. But when you run your body on fat fuel, you're like, your metabolism is going to be like a machine. You're going to feel really good. Your skin's going to look good. Um, it's anti-aging. It, there's so many benefits to your joints, stiffness. Um, I'm 52. Uh, like I feel like I'm 20. When I was yeah. in my 20s, I felt like I was 50. Um, right, right. 
<laughs> okay, so I want to just actually kind of bring this back around because what you're saying is really informative and I think it'll help a lot of my members. And actually, I'm going to look into this whole thing because I, I do advise um, my clients to eat their frequent meals, healthy meals throughout the day so that they don't get hungry and go binge on foods that they shouldn't be eating, okay? So I know I think it's really good. Maybe they could, you know, try your program to see how to transition away from, you know, those insulin spikes into something that might make them feel better and a lot less sluggish. But I do have to point out that even if you eat really well, it's not going to keep that butt from sagging and the tummy from not being toned. You kind of always mix it up with the workout because what the workout does is it works the muscle itself. It actually gives you the vitality and the energy that you need in order to enjoy this healthy body that you have internally, right? Externally, you can do more stuff, you are more agile, you have more energy, and when you have more muscle tone, that increases your metabolism as well, right? Don't you agree with that? Yeah, it does. You need exercise for sure. And actually, exercise builds the muscle, which then will increase your um your calories burned, okay? You'll burn more calories, right? But let me just talk about that for a second because that's another confusion. People say, oh, I'm going to build up my muscles so I can have a better metabolism. I go, okay, so you're going to burn more calories, but what calories are you burning? And they'll go, well, all calories. I'm like, no, you're going to either burn sugar calories or fat calories. Do you want to burn fat calories and not just the stored sugar? Then you're going to have to lower your carbohydrates because if you're doing the whole carbo thing and the fruit thing, you're burning up calories, but you're only burning up stored sugar calories. Now, let's yeah. check this out. So sugar calories, are, I'm talking about stored sugar as glycogen in the muscle and the liver. Mm -hmm. When you store glycogen, you're, you hold a tremendous amount of water um, because one glycogen holds two molecules of water. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, like, a, it's like a sponge of water, right? So right. when you cut the carbs down, you're going to dump a lot of fluid out of the system. You'll lose weight, water weight. Um, and you're like, wow, I lost all this weight, right? And then you eat the carbs back and you gain the weight back. And right. then you do the exercise. So exercise will dump the water because you're burning up the glycogen. You dump this water and you start going up and down, up and down. You're like, why? Why can't I actually just get all this weight off? Well, because you're running your body on sugar. So mm -hmm. if you were to just convert your body to fat burning, not only would you dump the water, you would lose fat and then here's, here's the point that I really wanted to tell you about. Um, you're into muscle physiology. You're into building more lean muscle because that's important. But when you have high insulin and high insulin resistance, which makes insulin not work, you can no longer build muscles. That's why the diabetics are flabby and they can't get toned even if they work out because it takes healthy insulin to work uh, absorb the protein. Uh, insulin controls protein. So... In other words, by doing this uh, program I'm talking about, you can actually fix the muscle, help the absorption, burn more fat, get rid of the fluid retention. It's just an overall really dynamic thing to do. So it sounds amazing. Okay. Now I have one question. With all the fruits and vegetables and the nutrients in there, the high fiber and the minerals and the vitamins, um, how do you suggest? that people get those same nutrients like for example like from the berries and like the by the vitamin c and all of those things that nature has provided for us uh, yeah. to actually nurture our bodies on a micro level great question uh, i would get them from the vegetables mm -hmm. and i recommend consuming um, about seven to ten cups of vegetables a day because mm -hmm. you need a lot of potassium mm -hmm. and like people like i i actually went to the restaurant a few uh, I think about a month ago, and they, they brought me the salad. It was a one cup of salad. I'm like, <laughs> I need a bowl. So I'm my right. salads are huge. So what you want to do is you want to start get, the, get your nutrients from salad or vegetables. But if you're trying to f do this thing I'm talking about, which I didn't even get into yet. I just kind of scratched the surface. Right. You don't want to do too much fruit. I mean, you can do a, like maybe one cup of berry a day, berries a day. But... Uh -huh. You start adding more fruit, and then now so we add the sugar into it. So, because the main problem of an average person is too much insulin, we want to we want to heal the sugar, a problem that we have. Um, now, if you've never actually abused sugar and you don't have a weight problem, you could probably get away with it. But for most of us out there that abuse sugar, 
Right. It's just an extra, it's too much sugar for our system to do fruit. And plus, the, the way they grow the fruits nowadays, and even the apples, they spike them, they make them very, very, very sweet, high levels of sugar. One, one apple yeah. nowadays is 19 grams of actual sugar. That's not carbohydrates, that's sugar. So you're like eating a candy bar. Wow, wow. So yes, that's really interesting because I think that it's a good distinction to point out that you need to sort of um, almost detox your body from the sugar dependency and the insulin spikes in order to get some of the benefits of the fat bearing disease. So in other words, you want to sort of reduce that glycogen storage so that your body's not always going there for fuel, but instead to where your fat is stored. That Was that what you're saying? Yes. You, you, you know, think about it. How much stored sugar you have, you have about a couple days worth of stored sugar. It's 1,700 calories. But right. you have about 77,000 stored calories of fat on a, a non-fat person. So it's a lot more if you're fat, right? right? So our bodies were designed to run on fat fuel as the primary fuel, not mm -hmm. sugar. It's only in the last, you know, a couple hundred years that we're, not a couple hundred years, but basically it's only recently that we've been focusing on so much sugar metabolism and not fat burning. But um, mm -hmm. when you start switching over and converting your body to running on fat fuel, mm -hmm. you will never go back because your cognitive function is going to be better, your memory, your um, metabolism, your, your whole mood will change. Your right. emotional state will change. You'll feel better. And so because the brain gets its uh, energy from either the, the blood, because it, it can't store sugar. So it gets its sugar from the blood, which if it's too high or low, it's going to be a problem. Right, but if you run your body on fat, which is called ketones, that's what thus right. the ketosis, um, your mood, your cognitive function will like totally change. And you're like, I feel so good. And then you go back to your sugar thing and you're like, I feel yeah. like crap right now. So, but you have to prove it to yourself. Let's come for some of my, my viewers out there who are, are listening to this and they're very intrigued as I am. How long does it take? Because that's a question I always get with fitness. How long does it take before I'm going to get results? How long does it take before I can see an actual difference? How long will it take before they can actually feel a difference from this, uh, these little adjustments that you're suggesting? Well, it depends on what kind of problem you have. Like, for example, if you have weight problems, uh, you'll probably dump the fluid out and you'll lo lose like five to 10 pounds in the first week or two. So that you'll be like, wow, that's dramatic. But as far as energy goes, it could take anywhere between three days to a week to up to six weeks to fully adapt to fat burning. And if right. the worse the blood sugar problem you are, the more diabetic you are, the more pre-diabetic you are, um, the longer the transition period is. But I have a lot of videos on how to make it smooth and easy. Um, mm -hmm. But you're going to notice some real nice changes within three weeks. But if you do this, I'm sorry, three days. But okay. if you do this, if you do this too fast mm -hmm. and you're not doing it correctly because you didn't watch the videos all the way through, and maybe you don't know about this or that, and you're not eating enough of this, you're going to go through a period of like transition where you might have like called a keto flu. You might feel kind of run down or keto fatigue or like, oh my gosh, because you didn't do it correctly. So the way I teach it, it's a healthy version. You do it gradually. And you shouldn't feel bad. You should feel really good. Mm -hmm. um, and so yeah. what's your philosophy on exercise? Because I, I know that you know a lot of my clients, when they're working out, a lot of times you may, if you're making a big change, like in your diet, you might feel a little more, more sluggish. But I find that when you work out, even if it's like on my YouTube channel, I have the 10 minute workout that you can do just 10 minutes a day and, and, and I'll help you to improve your mood and you'll be able to get through some of those tough periods because you start to burn up that extra insulin as well during your workouts. What do you feel yeah. about that? I, rec I recommend every person start exercising. The only, I mean, right away, you don't, have to slow, you don't have to slow down. The only thing that I talk about in my book is that you have the person that's really um, out of shape in there. They're basically um, a, adrenal dominant. They have a lot of adrenal issues. Like they go up the stairs and they're out of breath uh, and they just let their body go and they don't sleep. Um, those people should kind of do walking for a while, low pulse rate stuff, work up to it. Because I'll give you an example. I had this lady, I, I, this is when I first began. I put her through a whole workout and uh, spiked her pulse rate to 158. She came back the next day her pulse rate was 158 and I'm like, oh my, God. <laughs> oh my God. So her recovery was so poor oh, that you God. don't want to like push the person too fast. You want to kind of easily gradually go into it. So 
basically, if you're not sleeping, for example, you should go very light because it's very dangerous to the heart if you overdo it. But I mean, these are all just minor points um, that co common sense. Uh -huh. But I think every, think everyone should jump right into it. Breakfast in the morning. What's that? that you, what do you think about instead of doing the breakfast, you're not eating breakfast, about working out in the morning? Yeah, and I think most people can do that very, very comfortably. But what happens if you have a pre-existing low blood sugar situation, it's called hypoglycemia, and you work out and you tap out too much glycogen too fast, you can be dizzy or tired, in right. which case um, you either should work out during your time you're eating or just before uh -huh. um, until you can really adapt correctly. But I right. do want to mention one last piece of data because we're I know people like, I kind of like to keep it to 30 minutes because, uh, right. <laughs> but I want to add one little thing in here. This is something that kind of is a, a brain strain for people. Um, like, cause they're like, Oh, what do I eat during the, the workout? What kind of pre-workout snack do I eat? Right. I need right. that protein, 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 protein. That's like a common knowledge, right? We need to eat uh, or drink something, uh, some sugar water or whatever. Yeah. Um, well, check this out. If you consume, like, let's say a little juice or a little sugar or a protein bar with sugar, like most people do, or what's going to happen? You're going to basically knock yourself out of fat burning for about 48 hours. Wow, really? Yeah, because it's going to take now another couple of days before you get back into ketosis. So you don't, uh -huh. you don't want to do a sugary type of energy drink when you're working out or a Gatorade yeah. thing. And then even protein, yeah, uh, yeah. even the protein stuff, you'd be much better off waiting to the meal because when you're fasting between meals, you're stimulating growth hormone. Growth hormone is the main uh, fat burning hormone. It actually preserves your muscles and it actually will, um, in a female, you can, doing intermittent fasting, you can spike growth hormone by 1300% in a male body by 2000% by doing intermittent fasting. So it's like the anti-aging activity on steroids. It's a great thing to do. So with intermittent fasting, just to be clear, okay, yeah. how long should you go between meals? Um, you should start going, you should start at three meals a day. Okay. Mm -hmm. Keep it whenever you eat, slowly push your breakfast to a lunch. And I have a video on this, by the way. And then what you do over time is you slowly push your dinner closer to your lunch till you get about an ideal thing would be like four or five hours of between your meals. What that will give you is a tremendous amount of uh, fasting to create some serious improvement with the parts of the body that you want to work on. Yeah, and allow your food to properly digest, right? And your body can be You support the digestive system, but there's a lot of other things too that you can do that for anti-aging, it's like, and just for brain health, just to focus better. So what's the name of that video that they should look about getting started with that? that you um, if you go to drberg.com under educational tab, it'll say the ketosis mini course. It's a free course. I have like probably 50,000 people who did the course already, but you basically, it's like four short videos. Just go to Dr. Berg education. And you can also just go to YouTube and type Dr. Berg intermittent right. fasting, whatever topic, and I'll, I'll pop up and you can watch those videos. Okay, great. And then also for those people, I, one thing I noticed about some of the people that, um, that I know that have done your program, also um, some of the videos that you have, you have a lot of great content on workout stuff and fitness that I want to just, just recommend anyone who um, needs guidance or wants uh, to know how to do it correctly, and you can watch your videos um, on her website, which I'll put a link down below. You have uh, also a, like an online uh, program that people can, it's very affordable, that you basically go through a lot of great um, techniques, workouts, and it's almost like you're not, um, it's like you have a personal trainer, but now it's like you actually have everything like one-on-one -on -one in this portal that you can go into. So. I'm going to recommend people check it out. I'll put your link down below and I think yeah. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And also I think on your YouTube channel, you have a ton of workouts. So uh, right. you guys can check it out. I'm going to take some of your advice in because, you know, on the Tiffany Rothbard Club, you know, 
I really enjoy doing different workouts, but I mean, this, this has been so informative for me because you know, what you said about insulin is absolutely like mind blowing. I'm gonna look into it, look into some of your food plans and things like that, and maybe adapt some of them for the Tiffany Roth Fit Club members so they can get better results. Because I think what you're saying is really resonating with me. And I think that it'll help a lot of people and combine with the workout, which it helps your mood and the way that you look. So win, win, right? It's the, ice, it's the icing on the cake. Maybe I shouldn't talk about cake right now, but you know what I mean. <laughs> Great. Oh, well, thank you so much for uh, the video, and uh, we'll talk soon, and uh, thanks for sharing. Thank you. I've really, really learned a lot. Thanks so much for sharing, Dr. Burke. Okay. I'll talk to you later.